enforcement. When was the last time I saw my wife and child alive? Why in the world would an innocent, reasonable father and husband lie about that and lie about it so early? He didn't know that was there. Yeah, after that moment, Creighton Waters played the 911 call where Alec Murdoch first told the lie that he never went down to the kennels that night. Thanks for joining us tonight for News 19 at 6. I'm Andrea Mock. And I'm J.R. Berry. We do begin with the Alec Murdoch double murder trial as closing arguments ended for the prosecution this afternoon. Yeah, Creighton Waters making a lot of points, but saying again and again, it was a growing storm for Alec Murdoch. He was facing lawsuits in the boat crash. Uh, his lawyers that he worked with were finding out that he was stealing money. And then, of course, Maggie and Paul confronting him about his problem with pills. He said it was a growing storm, and that is the motive for these murders. We've been following this since the get-go, and today our Darcy Strickland has made her way to Collington County. She is beginning our team coverage outside of the courtroom. Darcy? Andrea, Jr. thank you so much. Day 27, we're six weeks into this Alec Murdoch double murder trial. And the goal of the prosecution today, as it has been the entire time, is to make sure that each one of those jurors does not believe the alibi that Alec Murdoch has put forward. So the judge adjourned court today about 445 after the prosecution rested. We are expecting that the defense will begin tomorrow morning. And then from there, the trial the, the the decision is handed over to the jurors. Joining me now to talk more about what's been happening in the courtroom over the last several weeks, Jay Bender, very good to see you. Good to see you, Darcy. Nice to be with you. So, Jay, you are the liaison between the court and the press, so you have been in there every day. What was the difference today uh, when you heard from the prosecution in their closing statements? Well, I think it was an effort for the prosecution to summarize its case, which is always more concise than taking the testimony. The testimony sometimes rambles, but after six weeks, I hope there's enough in the record for the jury to make a decision one way or the other. We had a moment to talk before this interview and I asked you, are deliberations going to continue into the weekend? It looks like Judge Newman has prepared us all for that. I think that's a likelihood. I would be astonished if the jury reaches a decision tomorrow. I don't think it'll get the case until well after lunch. If the defense takes two hours to close, then the prosecution gets to respond to that, then the judge will charge the jury, lunch will be in there somewhere, and then the jury will have an opportunity to decide the case. You've been an attorney since 1975, more than 40 years, almost 50 years as an attorney. You watch this case, how is it different from others? Well, uh, I guess the closest parallel I can think of is the Susan Smith murder trial up in Union, uh, and this judge uh, has recognized the value of cameras in the courts, has recognized the value of the press serving as a surrogate for the people to get information about this trial out. Uh, in the Susan Smith trial, the cameras were banned from the courtroom. Uh, I thought it would have been a great opportunity there to educate the country on what a trial was because the O.J. Simpson trial was going on at the same time and trials in South Carolina are different from trials in California. Judge Newman, unlike the judge in O.J. Simpson here, has kept control of the courtroom, kept control of the lawyers, and has moved the process along. The other similarity I can see between this trial and the Susan Smith trial in Union is in both cases the Department of Public Transportation decided to repave the main street at the time the trial was going on. So I wondered six weeks ago if they would finish the pavement before we finished the trial, and it looks now like the pavement has finished first. When you think about the Murdoch name and what it means to Collington County, I guess it was that much more important that there was so much transparency in this case. I think it's essential. I think the worst thing that could happen in a case like this is for there to be suspicion that either the prosecution pulled its punches or a juror had been bought. So I think from the beginning stages, from jury selection through the time the jury gets the case tomorrow, Judge Newman has allowed press coverage, has 
facilitated the coverage of this trial and everything has worked smoothly. Uh, we've had press organizations from around the world here. We've had local stations. We've had local newspapers. When the judge created the list of who would get reserved seats for the trial, the first two papers were the local paper, the Press and Standard in Walterboro, and the Hampton County Guardian. And from there, daily papers in the region, and then spread out to other organizations. And it's been very good. You touched on it just a moment ago, but I want to make sure we talk about this. Alec Murdoch is back in his cell in that Colleton County Jail. What does tomorrow look like for the folks who are in the courtroom? For the ones who are in the courtroom? And for him, yeah, well, the defense and closing arguments. I think it'll probably be an optimistic moment for him because it'll be his side presenting his version of events. Uh, it's probably difficult as a criminal defendant to sit there and listen to the prosecution uh, talk about the heinous murders that the prosecution is attempting to prove you committed, tomorrow he should be feeling better about his chances. Jay Bender, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Well, Darcy, always good to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So the morning started today with a bit of a field trip, if you will, for the jurors as they went out to Moselle to take a look at that property June 7th, 2021, as burned in the memories of the jurors who have been sitting through this for the last 27 days.